Okay, so welcome everyone. Um, we are now live on Facebook as well. Everyone here in the Zoom meeting is either a participant uh, with a wet pixel workshop or a up and coming wet pixel workshop. So we have sent in photos for Alex and Adam to actually review, which I think is a great idea. Um, it's definitely one of my favorite aspects of any workshop um, when we actually see the critiques of our own images. I believe we can all learn from each other's images. So here's to Alex, I'll pass it on. Right, um, welcome everyone. Um, I think this hopefully should be a bit of fun um, doing a online image review session. Before we, we get into that, I was just gonna say a few things, you know, hopefully later this year, some of us will be doing this for real. Um, I'm getting probably slightly more optimistic than I was a few weeks ago about, about travel returning to normal. But as optimistic as I am that we will be able to be, get to Lembe later this year without any too many hitches. I think we've also got to be realistic in this unusual time that anyone making any sort of predictions about the future um, is on pretty thin ice. That said, I think it's a great time to remind ourselves how much, how much fun it is going to Lembe. And I'm going to switch from me speaking to the screen to a screen share now. And hopefully now you should see my screen on the desktop. And I'm going to kick off with a couple of slideshows. Um, this is kind of one big slideshow, really. There's a few pictures of mine. Um, then there's some pictures of you guys having fun in Lembe. And then there's going to be a slideshow of the pictures that everyone's put in for review today. So this should now run. I think what I love about Lembe is I love the style of diving, that sort of treasure hunt feel of looking for these amazing animals, whether they're frogfish, rhinopius, mimic octopus, seahorses, pygmy seahorses. There's always something amazing to see. The photographic productivity on the dives, you know, even if you're not finding amazing subjects, you've got cool, cool things like these. There's great behaviors to shoot. There's fantastic, there's always something going on in them, but the density of life, weird adaptations of animals to their different ways of going through their lives. Um, whether those are, you know, well-known ones like frogfish and, and pygmy seahorses, weird creatures throughout Lembe keep us captivated as photographers. But I think what I love most about Lembe as a photographer is that every dive tends to be productive. There's lots of places you go diving and you kind of swim around for an hour and you maybe find something good to shoot or maybe you don't. In Lembe, dives are just packed with subjects to shoot all the way through. And I think that not only makes it a really enjoyable place to shoot as a photographer, but it also makes it a great place to learn because you're able to take lessons on board and get straight back out there and, and shoot again. To remind us now of all the fun that we've had down the years um, at Lembe, these are some photos from the la most recent Lembe workshops. And I know some of you joining this session haven't been to the last few, so, but others will see yourselves in this next slideshow. So you might even get some royalty free music to enjoy these with um but hopefully this takes you to to more enjoyable places um these are pictures from the last two lembe workshops so the 2018 editions and it's a mix up between the two weeks so the pictures come from both weeks so um, adam and i were at both workshops and obviously all the staff as well but 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 the participants so some of them from one group and some from the other and I think that's maybe one of the fun things about a session like this is although everyone here has, has done these workshops, no one's done all of them. And so you'll see pictures that you won't have seen during the workshop weeks, even if you've been to lots of these. I think it's us getting ready to go diving. Hopefully we'll be on the boat soon. I try to put in lots of pictures of people hugging each other because it, it feels unusual at the moment to see pictures as, as I think in a minute you'll see some pictures on the boats where everyone's hugging each other and it's like oh gosh people who don't live together with their arms around each other <laughs> oh yeah the sun always shines in Lembe Justin managed to get into that conga twice, so I think because of the panorama <laughs> feature on the <laughs> on the phone. Detailed dive maps to tell you how to zigzag your way slowly up a slope.
all this personal contact between people is the way to the good old days. Peace and quiet that comes once everyone's in the water. So hopefully that brings back some nice memories of, of fun times. And now to crack us straight into our review session, these next slides are the review pictures. So um, they're just gonna run through everyone's pictures who sent them in. They're just nice and quick, but it gives you an idea roughly where you're gonna come up in the slideshow and a chance to see all of them now. I think my plan for this session is, is really to sort of capture some of the fun and the learning that the workshops have. But I, I, you know, I, I want it to be a little bit different from a workshop because obviously you can't all, unlike a workshop, go diving in the morning in Lembe and put lessons straight into practice. So probably talk a little bit more generally than, than we do on a workshop. So maybe talk about the subjects and, and that sort of thing. Um, I also, I think um, one thing I want to say ahead of time is first of all, whenever we do these image review sessions for those tuning in and watching, we always cast quite a critical eye on the images. A lot of the photographers who come on these workshops are really good photographers. Many of them got lots of competition awards and that sort of thing behind them or publish their pictures regularly or, or just are great photographers, but aren't interested in any of those other things. And it's no point benefit really from a teaching point of view, just to sit there and go, yeah, these pictures are all great, 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 great. We, we don't learn anything. So we always try and cast quite a critical eye on the pictures. We ask those simple questions, what's, what's good and what could be done better? Hopefully now, there's a, my, you should now be seeing my picture of a frogfish, which is the first picture in the image review. And I was just saying that the other thing is, um, as well as casting a critical eye, I will sort of tailor the commentary to the photographers. And many of you I know very well. So those who I do know well, and I know are very good photographers, uh, will get harsher comments. So you might see a really nice picture and I'm being quite critical about it. That's actually a compliment to the photographer that I know how good they are. Um, so if you're tuning in and you, you hear us being critical, but I think it's important as photographers to always look to how we can improve images when we're, we're dealing with them. Um, the only other thing I want to say before we kick off is I want this review session to be nice and snappy quicker than we normally go through these things so that um, we can get through as many pictures as possible in the next 45 minutes to an hour or so. Okay, so the first picture is up. And Do we have an owner? I have successfully unmuted. I believe that one is mine. This is Paul. It is. Um, and uh, I like elusive squid. I don't usually uh, manage to get good shots of them. And in quickly going through my collection last night, looking for a, a shot of Lembe, because I forgot until it was very late that I needed to send it in yesterday, um, I found this one and was happy to find it. Um, if I shot it again, I think I would have uh, stopped down more because this was pretty shallow depth of field. I think the eye is in, but I wish the tentacles were more in. Um, yeah, so to jump straight in on, on that, that, Paul, I think technically I'm really happy with it. Yes, when you're shooting a subject straight into the open, as you would on almost any sort of black water experience or any mid-water subject like this, there's no need really to use a shallow depth of field because unless it's a super shallow one to give a really strong effect, because ultimately you've got your separation from that black background. So, and lots of depth of field will give you all the subjects in focus and you'll get great separation from the open water background. What I would say that would really improve this picture would be, it's all about the pose. There's nothing wrong technically, the lighting looks great, the subject is relaxed, but actually when you get a more elaborate pose from the subject, particularly when you get the tentacles up or out to the sides from these squids, the pictures really take, take things on. So if I was with this subject, I'd definitely get a shot like this and then say, I need to stick with this and stay with the subject and try and get a really nice pose. Right, next picture. Chris, this is yours, I think. Yes. Um, 
this is my um, picture of a, a, a peacock mantis shrimp. And uh, I had been taking a bunch of pictures of him in his hole and uh, noticed he took off and uh, that he was carrying eggs. So kind of went around and managed to get in front of him and he reared back and I got this picture. And I think it was um, a shock to me that I would got this picture that had all the eggs. If you zoom in, you can actually see all the little eyeballs, which was amazing to me. And um, one thing I didn't like about it, maybe you can talk to it, Alex, is on the right side, one of his fins looks like it's got a weird face on it. It's upside down, the face. I don't know if you can see it. It's right kind of in the middle of the picture. And I tried to downplay that a little bit uh, in, in versions I made. Kind of the right, right Boy, side. I, I can't. It kind of looks like the, yeah. Joker, like the Joker to me, upside down. <laughs> Which is weird. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah, I can't see the face, but first of all, I think that the the, the mantis shrimp carrying eggs is a is one of the most you know the, the most sought after subjects in Lembe, and very hard to to predict. And I particularly like this shot because it's it's got late stage eggs, so the eggs aren't just red balls; they're red balls with eyes in them, and I think that adds a real really interesting story as as to what they were what they are. Usually, and I think one thing I'd really applaud you on this is actually you often get these in a hole and your only opportunity is shooting down into a hole. And the fact that you had this in a hole and it came out and wanted to be shot by you shows that you were diving in the right way and giving the subject the right amount of space to it to want mm -hmm. to feel relaxed. And I think that's really good. I think the challenge of these always is they're a really great subject, but they live on the seabed. They're relatively large, so it's hard to get a good background with them. And mantis shrimps photograph brilliantly with snoots. But anyone who's sort of doing a normal dive, maybe has a snoot in their pocket, sees a mantis shrimp with eggs and then is able to get that snoot on their strobe and get it aimed at the mantis shrimp and get it all in, is doing a lot better than anyone else than I know. So yeah, so the challenge with these is always to control that background. I like the, the vignette you've put on this, but I would also, in terms of processing, I would definitely want to darken that area just behind the eyes so it's as dark as the rest of the background. And that's actually what a lot of people do with, with these shots is they okay. capture these shots and then they take that background down to help the picture work. If you can go in with a snoot or a, a single light source and light it with a single hard light, it looks great because you, you can light the subject up and not light the background. Okay, yeah. I'm gonna move on to the next one to keep us flowing along. Um, well, this was mine, Alex, um, going back seven years now to 2013. This was taken with my um, D7000 uh, with a 60 millimeter lens. It's one of my favorite subjects and I've never really managed a half decent shot of one, the juvenile pinnet batfish. Um, it needed quite a bit of post-processing and it's the amount of post-processing that I was sort of unsure about. Um, I've seen quite a few images before where the eye just disappears <laughs> and uh, I've yeah. processed this one, so uh, we can at least see the eye. I can on my laptop anyway, and we've got a, a bit of a pectoral fin there. Uh, mm. I just wondered whether the, um, where you lose the orange outline, where the fin is sort of twisted round um, at the top, whether that spoils the shot or not, uh, whether I should be trying to do something a little bit different. So my experience with this particular subject and you know i remember shooting this one it was up on the lembe island side um up on one of the sites quite a long way up well on that particular trip back in 2013. um my experience with this subject is they're not always super cooperative and you there's a you know yes it's easy to imagine exactly what you want but the reality is these guys look great when they're shot on a black background like this and getting them to pose against open water or lighting them with a snoot in order to get them on a black background like this is the biggest challenge. And I always feel anything else you get is a bit of a bonus. I really like the, the, them when you really get that clear outline all the way around. But actually when I've seen shots where they're completely side on, it's actually a little bit dull. And I think you actually, a little bit of movement in that outline is absolutely fine. So, I think when I process these types of pictures, one thing I'll do is I'll try and get that outline quite br as bright as I can all the way around. 
So it's not bright in some areas and darker in others. Here you've got some darkness around the back of the animal of the fish. And I think you could maybe just run a brush over that and brighten the orange up in that area. You kind of want that, you know, we often, there's, there was a, it's a very British reference, but when, when I was a kid, there was a breakfast cereal called um, Ready Break. And they used to have an advert where the kids had this orange glow around them after eating it in the mornings. And these guys always remind me of that. Um, and I think you want that out orange outline to really define the picture. For me, the eye, you definitely don't want to over brighten it in these pictures when you process it. I think when you over brighten it, you can often lose it. So I think you've got quite a good amount here. Maybe for printing, you'd want to brighten it a bit more than this. But for on-screen viewing, I like it being nice and subtle. It's a picture that draws you in because a lot of people, when they first see this, have no idea what it is. And then they actually, what is that? And then it pulls them in. And that, I think, is a, is a really nice response to have from pictures sometimes. You don't want every picture people to be staring at you, going, what the hell is it? But I think a shot like this works really well. But for me, it's all about that outline and all about the black background. I actually like the dorsal fin. I think that gives it some movement and some shape. I think when they're completely side on, they're not so good. But I would definitely brighten up some of the orange around the edges just to make it really make the outline work all across the picture. Okay, I'm going to move us along. This one, I think, is Andy's. Yeah, this is mine. So this is um, this was taken at Bianca, and um, I had previously tried to uh, take Mandarin fish back in 2013. This was taken in 2018, and in 2013, I wasn't very happy with the shots because I had the um, the coral in the background, and they, they they just didn't pose correctly. So I was happy with this, although I was really hoping to get um, more of a head-on shot, and I was I think. Teresa took a shot with eggs and I really like that but you know you only get uh, three or four shots in an evening and then you're done so um, I'm gonna have to go back and try again yes but I, like I, I, the, I like the color yeah I think what's strong about this is color focus and background and those are some of the hardest things to get with mandarin fish you know it's, it's, they're, they're very hard to focus on at, at night and to get that critical focus where the eye of both fish is sharp is the most important thing. Then they're a subject that's all about color. So you want that color coming through in the picture. Generally at Bianca particularly, if there's a little bit of current pushing through the bay there, the mandarin fish will, will rise up and just often, I would say nine times out of 10, will face into the current and just make their slow spawning rise into the current. So if you're seeing where they're coming up from and if you've got the flexibility on the dive, try and position yourself on the up current side. It means if you move about, you're gonna create dust that's gonna float straight onto the subject. So you have to be very still if you're shooting that way, but that's a good way to get them coming head on. However, I know this trick and I do that a lot and I'm often disappointed because I think Mandarin fish, you don't see their colors as well when they're coming head on. So actually the slightly more side on action often gives a better thing. In terms of the eggs, they nearly always release eggs during a spawning rise but it's usually at the end of the spawning rise. So it's just a case of being patient sometimes or not ending up, you know, losing the focus or running your flashes flat before you get to that key moment. But I think it's a mistake to generally, as a, you're now a full frame photographer, um, generally with a full frame photographer, I actually think shooting these sometimes on the 60, sometimes on the 105 can work well, a little bit like a, a black water shot actually sometimes just going for the slightly wider lens but knowing you've got the resolution to crop afterwards the 60 mil focus is really fast and it's often a better lens for these so you know what you've done well here is nail the focus and that's actually where most people suffer so um i, I would prioritize that but I, I like the shot very much right i'm gonna slide on to the next one susan i think this is you this is me um on this one, I really love one of the things you say in the workshops about trying to take pictures where you can capture uh, the context of the sea life in their environment. Um, noted that I am only using the uh, Sea Life Micro 2.0, and this was my very first workshop with you. So total novice, <laughs> but um, in tips for how to look in this kind of environment and be able to have capture the shrimp living in their anemone world um, is kind of what the feedback I was looking for um, from here. Yep, so for me, I would say that it's, it's a really nice way to shoot. I think 
a lot of the time as photographers, people are going for the, you know, you know, the, the way to get someone's instant attention with a Lembe shot is, you know, selective lighting, cool critter on a black background, filling the frame, bang, in your face, you get attention. But there's a lot of pictures like that. And I think when you try and tell these bigger stories, it, it offers a chance to actually really introduce people to this world. I think the challenge of taking these shots is to, is to keep them simple enough in terms of the amount of things you've got going on to make them work and to have strong, pretty elements in them. And I think the anemone tentacles here are a strong, pretty element and the shrimp is a strong, pretty element and the background is nice and clean. So I think you've done a really good job in managing the scene that you're dealing with. I think one of the challenges in Lembe when you try and shoot a bigger scene is you've suddenly got all this other stuff going on in the frame and it, it stops the, the picture working graphically. And I think this one with a nice sort of um, eruption of the anemone tentacles of the tube anemone and then, then the shrimp hovering there next to it, I think works really well. You've actually also got a little goby as well perched on the sponge there in, in the really? middle of the two. Yeah, you can I can just see him on, on my screen. Yeah. So yeah, so there's always something living under something in Lembe. But no, I, I think, um, and with the, with the gear you're using. Off, um, more with the little particles in the water or not worry about that? For me, the particles in the water are fine. As, as I always say with backscatter, you know, the ocean has got particles in it. And if those particles are a distraction, by all means, take them out. But a photo with particles is not a problem as long as they're not distracting you from the main subject. And until you mention them, I hadn't even seen them. Oh, I was too busy looking at the shrimp, looking at things. Yes, they're there. Yes, you might want to take a few of them out if you really want to. But I take backscatter out when it's a problem. I don't, if you actually look at a lot of my pictures, you know, there's plenty of pictures where there's no backscatter because I've maybe cleaned every last bit up. Uh, there's plenty of pictures that have got backscatter in because I don't consider it a, a distraction. And the sea has got particles in it. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next picture. I think this is Jeff. Yes, that, that is mine. And my question is, I, I think I got the crispy rhinophores that we all always try to get, but it's not a very compelling image to me. So, so what suggestions might you have for that? Well, I think it's a, it's a beautiful nudie. I think it's a Magnifica or something. Um, and I think you've got exactly the right angle. So for me, there's very little to criticize about this shot. Um, and to answer your question, the way you could get more impact is you could work this opportunity a little bit more. This nudibranch is a very large species of nudibranch. It's, you know, yeah. probably inch, inch and a half long um, to give it in, in imperial measurements. And as a result, when you do a frame filling shot like this, if you, 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 you generally get most of it in focus. A lot of the nudies we shoot from exactly the same angle as this are much smaller. And so you have less depth of field and you tend to get actually more impact from these shots when the depth of field is a little bit narrower. When those rhinophores are crispy sharp, but actually the, the narrow depth of field or the high magnification that's causing a narrow depth of field is less, the picture has more initial impact. So the things that you could do with this particular nudibranch, which is a big one, is you could have maybe gone slightly lower in the frame slightly closer in just a little bit just to really feel that frame and then in this particular case maybe open the aperture a little bit that would have kept the rhinophore sharp because your focus is on them but it would have blurred more of the rest of the body but generally you're doing everything right here the you know the the fail safe way to get impactful pictures of nudibranchs is to get in front of them and get them coming dead onto the lens like this and you focus on those 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 rhinophores and actually generally i think when there's slightly less depth of field, the picture has a more dynamic feel of movement. And I think here you've probably just got a little bit too much depth of field. So a case of either getting tighter in when you're shooting, or if this is as tight as you can get, open the aperture a little bit, and that will create that narrow depth of field that gives the picture that, that power. Thank you. Right. Next one, one of our frogfish. Um, I hope I might even bring the file name up on this one. So yeah. Terence, this is yours. Yeah, that, yeah that's my, thanks Alex. Yeah, so uh, with the frogfish, uh, per your advice, uh, you know, I was trying to make it look as hairy as possible. Um, so so that, that was objective number one. But the, the second one was, um, I, I remember um, from your one of your lectures about faces. So depending on the shape of the fish, uh, how much of the eye or the eyes you try to get in the photo. 
So with, with this one, I, I feel like, you know, I, I got both eyes, but because the eyes are on the side of the face, I didn't feel like it was particularly strong, as opposed to a, a fish with the eyes on the front, you know, looking straight at you. But I, I wanted to see what, what you thought of this o overall. Um, so overall, it's a nicely taken picture of, you know, one of the, the, the lustful subjects of Lembe. You know, hairy frogfish showing the hair, and the lighting that you've chosen here by lighting the frogfish but not lighting the surroundings really allows that hairiness to come through. The face for me works really well in this picture. So for me, the picture works really nicely. In terms of eye contact, we often talk about the fact that you know, the frogfish, particularly hairy frogfish, but, but most of the frogfish have their eyes quite on the side of their heads. They can swivel them a little bit to the front because they are ambush predators, but their eyes are quite side set. And actually in the, in the lectures I show pictures of, I think it's a clown frogfish. And my approach when I've got a frogfish and it's in a good position like this, and I've got my lighting and everything set up, is I'll take head on shots, but I'll also work my way around to at least one of the sides um, and get those side shots. And then give myself the option of choosing later which one I like. For me, eye contact is when you really lock the viewer in with those eyes into the picture. They can't ignore the picture. This picture, you can see both eyes clearly and the frogfish is clearly looking at you, but it's not reaching out and grabbing you. And if you so, and, and so often going for one eye really well is gonna work better. So, but I've got plenty of pictures of frogfish and you probably have too, when head on is definitely the right angle and then others where slightly to the side is the right angle. I would say more often than not with frogfish, slightly to the side is better than dead head on. But hairies in particular can look really nice head on because you actually get a very nice symmetry in the rest of the body in the hair. The hair often looks better shot from the front. So I would shoot hairies from the front more often than perhaps other frogfish because I think the hair particularly going up looks really nice um, head on. Um, this picture for me works really nicely. But um, I think you would have got better eye contact slightly on the side. But I would have shot both on the dive and then chosen afterwards which one I prefer. Okay, moving on to our next picture, which is David's. Hi. Uh, I've always been fascinated by these uh, shrimp gooey partnerships. I keep watching them every time I ever see them, trying to get pictures of them. This is one of the best I've got. My feeling about it is I could could be lower, but then I also have a problem with the dark the dark fish and the dark sand. Is there enough separation between? Them? I think these this is a subject that is quite challenging to produce a really really perfect image of, because both subjects are sitting on the sand, and the subjects are both long. And at no point are they going to be in exactly the same plane as each other. So if you want to show both the shrimp and the goby nice and sharp, you need to have a reasonable amount of depth of field. And because they're not in a line, you know, you can't just open up and blur the background. So although it would be really nice to blur the sand, if you choose to blur the sand, you're never going to have both subjects sharp. And what for me works in your shot here really well is I love that you can see all the details of the shrimp and I love how the antenna of the shrimp goes out and just is sitting against the cheek of the goby um, who's keeping the lookout for, the, for the, you know, the shrimp with its very poor eyesight. And I think that relationship is what makes this picture work really well. And I don't think you could have done anything different here, particularly to improve this shot. I think you just have to accept when doing a shot like this that you're always going to have that background sharp and there's not a lot you you know if you want to have both the shrimp and the goby nice and sharp so you can see this relationship you have to have that depth of field so i think you've done a really nice job the only thing you can do in a shot like this is shoot it with a reasonably long lens so that you can at least really fill the frame with the subjects so you can't really blur the background away but you can at least make the subjects as big as possible in the frame so that they dominate the composition so you know shoot them as big as they can crop them tightly and I think it will tell the story really well. But I think this shot is really nice. And I love that delicacy of how the antenna of the shrimp sits against the goby. I tried to um, get closer. A bit well at remembering. Yeah, yeah, closer or crop a little bit more. But the, uh, the problem was that I am frightened off. Yeah, but, but you've done really well. You've got it out. You know, eventually they're going to, you know, scoot off. And it's not always you that makes them, makes them scoot off. It could be something else in the water. 
Right, we'll go to Jeanette Seahorse now. Hi, um, I was using a Sony, <coughs> excuse me, compact camera and a single strobe. Uh, and, oh, excuse me. No problem. And um, this is a, a, a yellow or a Cuda Seahorse um, on, on the sand. I think this one was at, um, was it, is it, uh, it's was at it Jahir? Uh, J, 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 Jahir one. Yeah, Jahir, I remember, the, remember him. Um, he was a really popular one during the workshop, really nice, big seahorse up in the shallows. Or she was, actually. Um, yeah. So, um, yes, um, for me, you know, the seahorses as for underwater photographers, we know that they're quite a shy subject, that their favourite thing to do is to turn away from the camera. So, and I think the seahorses as well, they're a subject that everyone in the world could recognise. So we want to give the viewer that shape in our picture. And I think that's why your picture works well, is you've got good eye contact with the seahorse. You can see the eye, but you can also see the lovely shape of the animal. You've got the head and that, the body shape coming around those, those plates. And I think all of that makes a really good picture. The only thing I think with this particular shot you could have done better is if you've got the camera a little bit lower, right down into the sand. I think this picture yeah. for me just looks a little bit like you're looking down on the seahorse. Okay. And the light is sort of coming down on the seahorse. And I think the camera as low as possible, and it's one of the advantages of having a small camera, um, like a compact, yeah. you can get that camera really low and work that angle, even if you can't quite see the screen properly. You know, the more you can work that, that, that camera angle to get right down to the eye level, the more impact you'll get from the, from the image. Okay. But I think it's, it, it works nice light, and I think it's, it's nicely processed with the yellow against the black. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Now that I've got two strobes, uh, what do I do? Um, I think with this particular one, um, it, you could have lit it with two strobes, but actually, you know, one of the things we talk about a lot on the workshop is just because you've bought that second strobe doesn't mean you always need to use it. And I actually yeah. think the single strobe lighting works really well on this subject because it's, you're not lighting up everything around it, which is all basically tufty algae and, and dirty seabed. Um, yeah. You're just lighting up that seahorse and the single strobe aimed at it works really, really well. But okay. I would say there's, particularly on the more reefy sites, two strobes a lot more of the time. With this particular subject, this would be one to remember to go back mm -hmm. to that one strobe for. Okay, thank you. No problem. I think this is John's. Yeah, hi, John Melendez. Um, I, ch I chose this just because it's a, it's a somewhat rare um, subject and I was lucky enough to see it, but I was diving with non-photographers. So I was trying to be, um, you know, courteous. And so I only had a few minutes with it. Um, and I what figured I'd it? probably, it's a hairy octopus and it's, it's probably about two inches, maybe two, That's, two I and think a half it's smaller inches. than that. I would think looking, looking uh, at this, they're always small. Yeah, yeah, I might be exaggerating a little bit on that. So um, probably maybe about yeah, pretty close to two inches. But anyway, I, so I, I chose it just because in in this situation where you probably, given the circumstances, I had to move on fairly quickly. It's kind of a one shot. I may never see this again, and I I feel like I got kind of the blurry background but then it somewhat gets lost with the the red of the whatever coral or sponge that it's sitting on uh and this hasn't been uh, i don't do post-production but the question i guess is how can i make it better either when i took it or in post-production given um, that it's uh you know for me it could be a once in a lifetime subject Sure. I, I think um, with hairy octopus, they're a subject that none of us see very regularly and indeed lots of us have never seen. Um, so they're not, and also, yes, you, you've got to see this on a dive without other photographers, but I can assure you if you're on a dive full of photographers and there's a hairy octopus, you don't tend to have lots of time either because everyone's pretty keen to see it. Right. Um, because they're small and they're often on the move a lot, they're not always the most, e they're not the easiest subject to do. And the most important thing that you've got here is you've got that eye absolutely sharp and you've got the background blurry. Because the hairy octopus have a complicated body structure, and we, ha we had a, a few of them last time we were ran, ran the workshop, but not showing up with any reliability. Um, because they've got both eight legs and they're covered in hair, 
they're a very difficult subject for the viewer to understand what they're looking at. And so using that shallow depth of field is probably the most important thing. They don't tend to sit up on stuff, certainly not without, you know, certainly not if you're respecting their space underwater. So you're usually having to shoot them down into the seabed because that's where they're living down near the seabed. They don't sort of perch nicely sitting up on top of a rock. I like this shot. I like the eye being in focus. I really like the, the orangey rock that it's sitting on, the orange sponge covered rock. I would crop the picture a little bit from the top left corner, tighten up the composition and make the octopus fill a little bit more of the frame so that the viewer can really enjoy it. It's a bit low in the frame. There's no need. You don't need that top, top left corner. So you could bring the picture in from that top side. In terms of processing, I would then also just brighten it up a little bit. It's a touch, touch dark, particularly on the octopus. But I think generally you've done a pretty good job. I think the nature of this subject is, yes, it would be great to say, oh, you could try some backlighting with the hairy octopus or this sort of thing. And backlighting does look great with hairy subjects. But hairy octopuses are rarely going to hang around to give you the opportunity to start playing around with that sort of thing. And I think they're one of those subjects that you shoot when you see them. Shooting them with a relatively shallow depth of field is a good thing to do to get separation from the background. And you enjoy the fact that you've seen this amazing creature. I don't think they're a subject that you can really work photographically. You tend to get what you get with them. And I think you've got a really nice result here. So I think you've done really well and that's all it needs, a crop and a little bit more brightness. I think it's a really nice shot. Thank you very much. Appreciate the advice. No worries. I think this is Justin. Uh, yep, that's right. Uh, it's a candy crab sitting on its uh, piece of coral. It's a little bit um, un undersaturated on on my screen compared to um, when I usually see it. Uh, yeah. It's a big crop. Um, I took it on the way up uh, from a dive where I was almost running out of air. Um, I can't remember where the site was, but Adam will remember it. It's the one where we had the little um, pygmy seahorse Adam, that uh, you spent a long time on. Um, <laughs> the, <clears throat> uh, the, uh, yeah, Maybe I like the Maybe Macaweda. It, 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 sounds about yeah, right. Macaweda yeah. too, yeah. Um, I like the shot. I like the composition with the, with the uh, bright yellow coral in the background out of focus, looking like a kind of sunburst. And uh, one of those surprises that you find in, um, post-production is that it has its own uh, little amphipod, I think, uh, sitting on the top of its head. Um, it, it, because it's such a big crop, I think it lacks, it loses a lot of detail. Um, in particular, there's not particularly good separation between the crab and the uh, coral that it's sitting on. Oh, I wouldn't, for me, the, the separate, I mean, the picture as it is, you know, yes, it's a big crop, but the picture as it is, is graphically really strong. You've got great symmetry in the subject and it's got loads of separation because it's framed against this background. I think the yellow coral behind, I guess probably a leather coral or something, if it's on that side, um, is kind of a bit weird looking, but it looks quite cool. It certainly, I, I, had, I couldn't figure out what it was behind it when, when you sent it in um, and I was just copying them across. Um, so I was really curious to hear about it. I'm not convinced I can see the amphipod on its head. Um, they, they normally, you know, the, the candy crabs, the mistake that a lot of people make with candy crabs is they shoot them from the wrong side. And this one, you've got it coming face onto the camera, which is really good. They clip with their pincers polyps off the coral and stick them to their body. And what's on its head is usually a bit of clipped off coral um, of the, from the dendronepthia that it's sitting on. So right, that's okay. what I, I think thought I could see a couple of sort of antenna sticking up. Yeah, I think they're the spikes of the coral or the spikes of the crab. But I, I think the, the composition, it, look, it looks really good. Um, and I think it's, you know, so uh, for me, the colors are a bit weird on my computer. Uh, you say it doesn't look saturated enough. Um, for me, it's got more than enough saturation on my computer. So I don't know how it's coming through on the feed, but it, it, looks, it looks super punchy on mine. So but yeah, super punchy on mine too. too Okay, I'm going to keep us moving along because I'm wary of the time. We haven't got through everyone's pictures once yet, so. Hi, Alex, it's Liz. Hi, Liz. That's fine. Um, this was the shot that I told you I wish we'd taken when we were doing the shootout and looking for nudibranchs. But um, 
the two things about this shot. I found this nudibranch by myself. I didn't have Sandro or Dimpy or <laughs> anybody else find it. And secondly, you know, as you can see, I was playing with shallow depth of field. What I'm wondering is if I've got the too much in focus in front of it with a little bit of seaweed or whatever's in front of it. But I kind of like, you know, I like the bouquet. I like the kind of yellow behind him. But, but that's kind of what we got there. And it's a uh, Olympus OM, uh, EM, OM, well, it's, forget it, it's is an it, Olympus. Is it, is it an EM5 or an no, EM1? EM1. EM1, okay. Now, anyway, um, what I really like about the shot is, is that depth of field. I think, you know, we were talking about Jeff's shot earlier, actually, and talking about how to make this angle work to give you impact. And I think the shallow depth of field and the excellent focus on the rhinophores really makes this subject jump out. I love how the, the edge of this, of, of, of its, its, its black line around the edge of the body is so symmetrical. It frames those rhinophores and then goes back out and frames the gills at the back. And I think that works beautifully in the picture. I think the depth of field is really good. I think it could take being cropped a little bit tighter, really because it would actually import, increase the impact of it. And particularly the little bit of grass that runs across its face, that's actually relatively easy to get rid of in Photoshop just because of the way it is. And you might want to consider doing that with this picture because otherwise it's so perfect. It's got wonderful symmetry. It's got perfect focus. And just, just that one, I wouldn't take the, the grass off to the side, but the one piece of the filament that goes across its face, it would be nice to take that out. It may actually be feeding on something like that, but I, I think I'd take it out in this case because it's, um, it, it does just distract a bit from the perfection of all those shapes in the picture. But I really like the shot. I think it's really good. Just a slightly tighter crop, and I you know take that out. It looks really good. Um, okay, next picture. Nick. Ah, uh, yes, I'm here. Uh, this is mine. It was um, taken on the Wet Pixel Lembe 2018 trip. It was um, Tenderosa. Uh, I'm not sure where my buddy Justin had got to, uh, so I got this uh, the whole dive with this guy to myself. <laughs> Quite nice. Um, it's an ornate pygmy with eggs, of course, shot with a D500 and my Lembe lens combination, 60mm CMC1 and a three-stop ND filter because it's shot at, uh, it's wide open at, uh, I think it's 3.5 or 5.6, something like that. I, so, yeah. I really like this image. I, it was one of my favourite ones that you took on this trip, on the trip. And it's not a picture that for me is, you know, aged or aged badly. I still really like it now. But I've, I've actually sat in, a, in a, 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 a couple of sort of competitions where it's come up. And obviously, because it was taken on my trip, I can't be the cheerleader for it. And it hasn't worked for the other judges to the degree it works for me. So I think it's fantastic. I love the, the, the eye, the, the mix of colours. I love how the, the, the eggs are rendered in the bouquet at the bottom with sharp bits with the yellow egg sacs and the yellow in the egg sacs, you know, picking up the colors of the, of the, the subject. And I love the black background on this subject, which is you don't normally see with this particular subject often. It was, I think it was shot, oh, sorry Alex, it was shot with, uh, it, was, it was sat in a coconut shell. So I was able to get my strobes either side of it. So just hitting the, the front of the, uh, the shell, so. Yeah, and I, I, I really like this shot. Um, I think you might have shared this one with Nur actually as well um, on the dive, or was it another different one? Um, uh, I may have come. I may have gone gone after her, perhaps. Um, but yeah, but it's. Um, I, I think it's 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 really really nice. But it surprised me that for others it hasn't worked the same degree. Um, and maybe you know some of the things that maybe they don't like is you know the, the fact that actually the depth of field is so small, and you don't need shallow depth of field in this picture because it's got that black background to get separation. And maybe actually, if you're going to see a bit more detail of the mouth, it wouldn't just be this eye in a load of yellow. And maybe I like it because I know exactly what it is. And maybe for judges who maybe don't appreciate what it is, they maybe struggle a bit to get into the picture. Um, but I think it's fantastic. And I'm just sort of trying to analyze it from the point of view as why others don't get as excited about it as I do. I think it's a beautiful shot. And I really like the colors. I really like the, you know, it's got a really different feel to it. And I think it's a beautiful subject. Alex. Oh, uh, excuse me, Alex. What is the purpose of a neutral density filter? 
um, where a neutral density filter basically is like using an even lower ISO value on your camera. So okay. if you want to take a picture um, where there's too much light, either from the sun or from your strobes, you might put a neutral density filter. And quite a lot now in Lembe, we, we tend to buy really cheap 67 mil ones, which you can screw onto the front of most of your dark close up lenses and things because they're all 67 mil thread. And you just keep them in your pocket and put them on when you need them underwater. So for example, in, in a macro shooting situation, if you want to take a picture with a very open aperture, and you don't want your strobes or the ambient light to overwhelm the subject, what you can do is put a neutral density filter on and it can allow you to shoot at a, a wider aperture. The problem with underwater photographers is if you show them a new gadget like a neutral density filter, they all want to use it all the time. And you should only put it on if you've already put your ISO to the lowest possible value. Um, because if you haven't done that, there's really, all you're doing is making it harder for the camera to focus, harder for you to see the subject. So you want to use your ISO first to get rid of the light. But if you want to do a shot, say, in very bright conditions, very shallow conditions, they're a really useful thing to carry. But I'm, you know, I do see people using them when they don't need to be using them. But particularly on sort of a tropical trip in the Red Sea or something where it's really bright, they can be really powerful to create really completely different look pictures. Um, so they're a really useful thing to carry. And the ones you want are either two-stop or three-stop ones. Two-stop ones are called ND4s. Three-stop ones are called N. The cheap ones on Amazon in 67 mil, and you can screw them on the front of your macro lens. Um, if you're a Nikon shooter, or on the front of your housing. Um, so, yeah. Right, I'm going to move on from this because I'm, I'm aware we're coming up towards 50 minutes. Thanks, Alex. No worries. Um, Luca, it's got your name on it. Yes, hi. Can you hear me? Yeah, I think this was shot at the, um, at the house reef. Um, and uh, I use a Sony uh, A7R 3 on a 90 mil. And I think it only had one strobe. So one thing that I like of Lambe, I, at least uh, something I've observed, but uh, maybe I'm not correct, is that I find um, nudie branks to sit always on top of things, kind of. <laughs> and they, they tend to be a bit easier to photograph than elsewhere. I'm not sure for where he's look at seagrass or or at least I was lucky when I was there. So this allowed me to play with it. Um, I think I think really in Lembe it's often a case that there are there's so many nudie branks compared to sort of a lot of places you dive that actually maybe the ones that are hiding you don't notice, but the ones that are in prominent positions you notice. Um, or the guides sort of, you know, uh, are not going to point one out that's hidden away underneath a rock, but they are going to point one out that's sitting up nice and proud like this and nice and relaxed. Um, so, you know, what's nice about this is you've got the focus bang on those rhinophores. And I have to say, um, both your shot and Liz's shot, the rhinophores, you know, super crispy sharp, look great. And I love this view down the body with the rhinophores sharp and the way they frame up around the gills. And I think particularly... Um, this species, which has these very large gills coming up, looks really great with this 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 view, with the the the, the, the gills frame like that. I think the whole picture works works very nicely. The one thing I would say is I would think this picture would look a little bit more elegant in a a three by two crop as opposed to this four by three crop. So that's the aspect ratio of the picture. The picture's quite square here, and the subject is quite long and thin. And actually, I think a three by two crop would actually make the subject more evenly distributed in the frame and still be kind of a classic aspect ratio. So just because there's, there's basically more space on the sides than there is top and bottom, and the, the three by two crop would actually even things up. And I think it would look really great like that. It would also probably just yeah, play the symmetry. Sorry. Uh, I'm just saying that the original shot is, as you say, it's just this is an upload for Instagram, and Instagram prefers this format. To yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And yeah, and yes, of course, you told me you didn't have a computer um, with you. So you had to just send some grabs off Instagram. Yeah. The other thing you can do on Instagram is you can crop it as you want it to and then put a white or a black border around it. Um, and then and then crop the whole thing out to that four by three that Instagram likes. <clears throat> OK, keep chugging along. An enemy fish, one of my favorites. That one belongs to my husband, who's also working. He was going to come pop in and out. So this is Sydney. That belongs to Steve Hoyler. So um, nice shot. 
Um, I think why, so no, first of all, I, uh, oh. um, it's Steve. Oh, here. <laughs> um, th thank you for uh, this, Alex. It's a wonderful uh, project. I'm ducking in and out of seeing patients here. Um, this, uh, this is one of those shots where I, I overlooked it the first time. And um, I, I just, uh, I like the moodiness of it. Uh, and the, the personal uh, feel of connection. Um, so I was just wondering, uh, does it work as, you know, should I have uh, not cropped it quite so closely or should I have uh, uh, cropped it even more? Um, I definitely not crop more. So I like it very much as it is. It could probably work with a little bit more space as well. So it's very nice as it is, but it could work with a little bit more space. Um, I would, I, I think the picture is, is really strong for a few reasons. First of all, the lighting, which is in this frame here anyway, is all coming from one strobe. You may have, if it's cropped quite a bit, you may have had another strobe doing something else somewhere else. But in this part of the frame, there's one strobe coming in from the side. And it's really brought out the texture of the anemone and also lit the anemone fish up really really nicely i think this is a, a merton sea anemone with a saddleback anemone fish and i think that that lighting works with these short knobbly tentacles of the anemone really really well i also think that the color palette of this frame which is relatively restricted it's just kind of olives and golds is really really nice and i think that makes for a really really pleasing feel to the shot so i think all those things work really well i like this that tentacle that whips in next to an enemy fish and just lies above its eye. So it's got really good detail, really nice, simple image. And I think this is the type of shot that would print really, really well. I think it looked really great as a print. So I think it's a really nice shot. The final thing I want to say about it, I'm trying to keep the speed up, is that anemone fish, although you can shoot them everywhere, Lembe is a great place to shoot anemone fish because you can find them on almost every dive. Um, there's no, you know, no one else wants to shoot them. They're often up in the shallows, so you can do them when you're safety stopping or as us photographers are doing, trying to eke out those last few breaths in the tank um, at the end of the dive. And I, I think they're, they're really well worth working. But this shot is all made by that lighting. The lighting just works so well. It's a lovely pose, great focus, and, and it works really, really nicely. I really like it. Mm -hmm. Right, I'm gonna keep us trucking on to, Thank you. to Sydney's. Yeah, this one is mine. Um, I felt so um, excited to be able to see this octopus go from one home to the next. And um, I um, j just want any input that you might have. Um, and I'm really fond of the colors in this as well. Yeah, I, I think it's for me, you know, the coconut octopuses and the shells, go, you know, that they use for their houses is, is what is for me a real classic lembe subject and one to shoot really well. What I like about this one is because it's quite a light shell, it's enabled you to light the shell and the octopus up really well and the, the brightness of the shell is reflecting light really well onto the octopus and because you've exposed for that, the seabed around it is nice and dark. So it's almost on a black background. So it allows you to really focus in. I think what's good about this is though, is you've timed the shot so that the arms of the octopus are clearly visible. I think when they really pull the shell together and it's just a pair of eyes and a shell, the picture is often hard for the viewer to understand what's going on. Here, you can see exactly what's going on because you've timed it so well. You can see the face of the octopus, but you can also see how it's using its arms to pull the shell in around it. And I think those things make the shot work well. So when you have got this subject, yes, it's a great subject, but it's also about timing that shot well before the octopus has clamped the shell's tooth closed around it and you can only see its eyes. It's often better when you can see the, the arms like this. So I think it works really, really nicely. Nicely in focus, really well time shot. Thank you. Right, this is Teresa's picture. Um, yeah, that's me. This is our last dive in Lembe and I was trying, I was just playing around with trying to be creative and using some backlighting with different colored um, torches and panning, a combination of panning and this pair of um, the ornate ghost pipe fish. So, I, you know, I'm not, I, I have mixed feelings about it. I'm not sure if it works. Um, some people I think don't really get it. And um, it's more of an abstract kind of imagery. I, I like it. Um, but I have any um, comments about what 
you could do to improve it. I, I really like it. I think, I, I, you know, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't want to see every picture taken with a pink torch. But I think, you know, when you use these effects sparingly, and particularly when you present them in amongst your whole portfolio of work where you've got, you know, lots of classic pictures of all sorts of creatures from around the world, they can work incredibly well. And I think what's good about this is it's technically, it's a good shot. You know, the ghost pipe fish are both nicely posed, nicely in focus, fins out. So you get to see the subjects nice and clearly, but you also get to in in enjoy the textures that the long exposure has, has created. And I think particularly using the torch as the backlight has, has created that, um, you know, the, that sort of pink effect as well. If it was all done with strobes, that pink, it would be frozen in time and you wouldn't get the blurring in it. So actually using the continuous light source for the background and then having the foreground lit with a, 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 a spring of flash and then having the ambient light as well. So the three light sources together, I think creates a really interesting and different picture. I do think it's a picture that, you know, someone who maybe has never seen this animal before might be a bit frustrated with. They'd probably want to know a bit more what they were seeing. But I think for someone like me who's seen lots of pictures of this, I really like it. I think the textures, particularly on the male, the lower one, sorry, the female, the, the lower one. Um, oh, wait a sec. Um, no, it's female ghost bite fish that have the eggs. So the female's the top one, the male is the lower one, sorry. Um, the, the male who's the lower one. Um, I think the the pinks on it, textures around him are really, really nice. And I think the picture as a whole works really well. I would perhaps crop it a little bit just because the space at the top of the frame is not as interesting as all the textures around them. Mm -hmm. um, but apart from that, I think it looks really great. I think it's really interesting, really different, and you know, nice to see this this effect done on on the ghost pipefish. And they're a really attractive pair of ghost pipefish. I think mm -hmm. these are the ones up at Air Badjo. Um, yeah. over there. Thank you. Um, all right, I'm going to keep buzzing on. Um, this picture was taken by Tim Priest. Um, who actually um, retired from diving back in 2013. So I was really pleased that he sent some pictures in. And I don't think he was going to join Zoom and talk about it. I'm just going to check it is his. Yes, it is. Um, and these were, um, these frogfish were, oh, this particular one, which is, I think was the large female, were in the shallows at about two meters depth at, um, at Nudie Falls on that 2013 trip. And we'd often go and see them at the end of the dives. And after a while, they were so reliable, people started going with wide angles. And so I love that this is shot with a wide angle lens. I think anyone, you know, you should always take at least some sort of wide angle with you to Lembe, um, just to give yourself, particularly towards the end of a trip, the opportunity to broaden your portfolio and take on, you know, the may only one or two things on that dive that will work, but they give you a really nice, nice effect. And I like the hard lighting that he's used here to create all the shadows. So I think it's created a really powerful, impactful, and very different type of shot. So I think this works really well. And Tim also was um, well known um, in those days for, he used to do sketches in his, his, his logbook. So he sent me his sketch as well, which I thought I'd show. Um, this is one of his sketches. He used to do a logbook after every dive and sketch some of the critters that he saw. So I like the separation that he's achieved with the, the spearing mantis shrimp on the paper there. Anyway, right. Um, Kathy, this is your one. Uh, hi, hi. I'm struggling. I'm back on my phone now because we've lost internet. Um, Bangai cardinal fish in an urchin. I guess I'd like to make it more exciting when I get a chance again with perhaps a blurred background. Um, they're quite. I found it quite difficult to get what I wanted because the urchin keeps moving. But it was my first go at them, so I'm pleased with the colours. Yes, I'm. Um... When I, um, I'm quite impressed actually, I remembered most of the pictures because I didn't look at them apart from when I dragged them across, but so um, into the folder. So I've done well, I'm pleased. Um, when I saw this one, I was thinking, most of the subjects I kind of feel, oh, I've got a nice picture of that. So I've got an idea of what works. But I really like this subject matter of the bang guys on these fire urchins, but I find it quite hard to shoot well. And I think part of the challenge is, is that these urchins, and it's quite easy to overexpose the, um, the cardinal fish on them. So in terms of this picture, I think that actually, I, I really like those blue dotted lines that are part of the urchin's design going backwards. And I think that your composition 
with the red and those blue lines leading the eye through the frame works really well. And then having the cardinal fish there is really strong. I think a smaller cardinal fish might actually work better. I know this is quite a youngster, but one of the really tiny ones can often look even more amazing because it then turns this urchin into this otherworldly thing. Just, you know, it's reds and colors and weird. And then there's this tiny little fish floating about in it. So yes, go for a shallow depth of field maybe next time, but I think actually maybe going for a smaller fish, fish. as well, yeah. but definitely keep that V. I think that V of the blue lines and the red around it is really, really strong. So it'd probably be a case that you might switch over to manual focus and you know, you'd just be there holding this composition and waiting for the fish to pop into focus and then zapping him off and seeing whereabouts in the frame he ends up could work could really nicely. I think this is really a really nice shot as it is. Um, and it's a subject that I have shot a lot, but don't really feel that I've unlocked the, I think I showed one at the beginning of the slideshow, my slideshow, a top down view, but I never I really felt, that. yeah, I've never really felt I've quite unlocked what, when you're down there, it looks incredibly beautiful, but I've never quite figured out how you get the perfect shot. Um, I just got a couple more to do. I'm going to keep us moving because I think we should wrap up once we've been through everyone's first picture. Um, I think it's just a couple more of those to go. So Horatio, this is yours. Hi. Uh, yes, Hi. Uh, this is one where, you know, most, most of the time I'm trying to avoid uh, illuminating what's in the water. And this time I was trying to illuminate what was in the water, what, you know, what they're, what they're trying to filter from the water. So um, that, that's, that's it. Yeah. And I mean, it's, I think that the, the lighting in this shot really, really makes it. Um, you know, the porcelain crabs are a popular subject. Not often people catch them when they're feeding partly because you know they need to be relaxed to be feeding, but also um, they're not feeding all the time. And you've also then got to time your shot because when they whip out with their, their feeding appendages to filter the water, um, you know, a little bit like fishing with nets, um, you know, you've got to time the shot. And I think you've timed this brilliantly to catch the nets out from both sides. And also I think the lighting is, is particularly good because it's, it's turned what would be a really busy background with loads of an enemy and everything going on in the background that would have been really distracting. Um, and the selective lighting has allowed you to light the, a little bit of an enemy to give the picture a base, to light the crab and then to light those, those, those feeding arms and the lighting up of the particles in the water looks really good. It tells the story really, really well. Um, I would have been interesting to see a shot from the other side where you've got a bit more of the face of the crab in the picture. However, I think the back of the crab with all those spots is more attractive than the face. So probably if you did the shot from the other side, I'd prefer this shot because I think this shot looking down on the crab looks, looks really nice because the back of its carapace is so pretty. But what makes this picture really interesting and different is the, the style of lighting and that capturing of the behavior so clearly. So it's a really nice shot. Um, I think it works really, really well. I like the lighting, like, like, the, like it very much. Is that a smooth, Alex? Um, I think, yeah, I think it's, it's Snoot. Yeah, well, it's contained. a retro, retro Snoot. Yeah. It's amazing. It's a really great shot. I'd like to stop this now just because I think it's worked really well. And um, it's been really nice actually having this experience. It reminds me of being away and having fun with, with, with us all doing all this. Um, I didn't know how this was going to work out. It was just sort of a, a little bit of a last minute idea. Um, which we had, I think, on, on Sunday or Monday or something, and, and we've just sort of thrown it together. But I'm really pleased with how it's worked. It's been really nice to see you all again. I'm going to stop my screen sharing, and so we can go back to the nice wall of, of faces, which makes me feel good. Um, I've really enjoyed doing the session with everyone, and I hope you, you have too. Um, it makes me itch to get back underwater again. So I'd like just to, to finish by saying um, a big thank you for all of you for sending pictures in. Um, and for all being there and being on top of muting and unmuting, which has made it really, really good fun to do. Um, a thank you to, to, to WetPixel for organizing these amazing workshops that we've had down the years and to Lembo Resort for hosting us all so wonderfully. And I really hope we're able to get back there very soon and, and have more fun and create more pictures. So from me, that's a big thank you to everyone and, and goodbye. So thanks very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Alex. It's really, really nice to see you all. That's been Thanks, perhaps the best, best part of it. Uh, yeah.
Thank, Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much.